changing things up a little bit. I know that's everybody's favorite phrase. Uh, here comes some change. Uh, but we're going to be changing things up a little bit for our communion Sunday. We've wanted to, as we've talked about things, uh, Mark and Kelly and I, we've wanted to make communion more central to our worship on the Sundays that we observe communion together. And so for communion Sundays, we're going to do a series of messages to go along with communion called, What Difference Does the Cross Make? What Difference Does the Cross Make? And it's going to be a look at the significance of the value of the person and the work of Jesus Christ through various perspectives in Scripture. So we're going to be taking a look at Christ through the lens of another set of eyes every week that we celebrate communion. And the set of eyes that we're going to be looking at or looking through this morning is, is coming from a man named Caiaphas. Now Caiaphas, as you might already know, uh, was the high priest of Israel during the time of Christ. And it's hard to imagine a more important and more privileged and prestigious a role among the Israelites than that of the high priest. I mean, basically, the high priest was sort of their version of the Catholic Pope. And he was to be a godly man. He was to be near and dear to the heart of God. He was to be righteous. He was to be a worthy representative of his people as he represented them before God, giving sacrifice for their sin. He was also to be a learned man, one who could teach and apply the law of God and do it with skill. Malachi 2.7 says that the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. However, the priesthood had fallen on hard times during the life of Jesus Christ. The high priest wasn't chosen based on his righteous devotion to God or his learned understanding of the law. No, he was selected for his capacity to keep peace among the Jews on behalf of the Roman overlords. So basically, this was a man who was selected by the Roman governor more than anyone else. And so the role of the high priest became subject to political maneuvering. It became subject to cronyism and greed. And important men clamored for this role in order that they might have access then to the wealth that funneled through the Jewish temple and all of its sacrifices and money changing and that sort of thing. And so Caiaphas was such a man as high priest. So the question is, how did he view Jesus? Well, I think no passage captures his view of Christ quite like John chapter 11. If you want to make your way in your Bibles there, John chapter 11. Or if you have the Version app on your phone and you can go to events under the Version app, the scripture will be there. And to set the context for the passage that we're going to be looking at here in John chapter 11... This was toward the end of Christ's life and ministry. In fact, his last Passover was just around the corner in which he would die a horrendous death on the cross. And Jesus, going into this passage, had just raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And news of this miracle made its way back into Jerusalem, made it back into the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the Jewish high council in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And Caiaphas, being the high priest, was a part of this council. And he was a major part of the decision making that we're going to see in this passage as they make a decision, a crucial decision about Jesus Christ. So let's look at his reaction to Christ in verse 45, chapter 11 of John. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, in other words, they're reporting. Uh, the miracle of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? 
For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place, he's probably referring to the temple, and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And so here we have Caiaphas being an accidental prophet. He says one thing that's meant one way to him and God actually uses this statement to, to prophetically mean something to God. It, it means something about our salvation. Picking up in verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him, Christ, to death. So how did Caiaphas view Jesus Christ? Well, I think the one word that would describe his set of lenses toward Jesus would be expediency. He saw Christ with expediency. Now your translation may even use that word in verse 50 or a variation of that word where it says, or where Caiaphas is quoted as saying, it is better... Or maybe your version says more expedient for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He was being expedient. I think that's a good word to describe what he was doing. Here's the definition of expedience. To be expedient is doing what seems to be beneficial, even if it appears to go against what is objectively right or true. And that is what Caiaphas was doing. He's guilty of a sort of self-serving expediency when it comes to Jesus Christ. He had elevated his own convenience, his own status, his own position, his own privilege above the truth about Jesus Christ. He knew who Jesus was. This decision made by the high council was in light of the fact they recognized that Jesus was legitimate. He was the Messiah. He was the one he was claiming to be. They did not try to refute any of his miracles. They did not say that they were illegitimate in any way. But they just wouldn't have him. They just wouldn't have Christ because Christ threatened the status quo. Having Jesus as Messiah threatened their position, their privilege. What if Jesus upset the Romans? What would happen then? And so Caiaphas justified killing Jesus under the pretense that it was best for his people. He was trying to come across as some great patriot. You know, we, we need to be careful that, that we, like Caiaphas, don't treat Christ with the same sort of self-serving expediency. How is it we would do that? Well, number one... Just like Caiaphas, out of expediency, we might reject him. We might reject him. We, we, we don't want Christ to mess with our comfortable patterns, our comfortable ways of life. We don't want Christ to threaten our status quo. We, we don't want him to, to place any demands on our lives that, that we are unwilling to meet. Things like becoming his disciple, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Becoming his disciple, his claim on us as his disciples, uh, is his claim on our lives as believers. We, we don't want to, as he asks his followers to do, to take up a cross to follow him, to die to self in order that we might live for him. And so out of expediency, we oftentimes reject him. Second way that we might treat Christ with this sort of expediency is that we might be willing to receive him, but only if he comes on our own terms. Caiaphas would have loved to had a Jesus who played by Caiaphas's rules. He would have loved to have a Jesus that he could dictate to. 
He wanted a safe Jesus, one that, that would never threaten Caiaphas's position and privilege, that would, would never threaten his little nest egg that he was building there in the Jewish temple. We have to be careful that we don't treat Jesus Christ that way. We can be so tempted to distort the truth about Christ for self-serving reasons. For example, you know, many people love prosperity gospel Jesus. He's the Jesus that if you just believe in him hard enough, he is going to make you healthy and wealthy. He's going to help you live your version of the American dream. If only you believe in that sort of Jesus hard enough. Prosperity gospel Jesus. Secondly, many people love American patriot Jesus. And they hope by believing in Jesus that this makes America basically uh, uh, similar to the people of Israel. A, a covenant people of God that we find with Israel and the Old Testament. And people who want an American patriot Jesus, you know, have a hard time very often distinguishing between the American flag and the cross. They try to hijack him for their own political means. Many people love a Dr. Phil Jesus. Sort of, sort of Jesus who, who, who came to, to fix all of our emotional and, and relational problems to, to show us how to get happy, to show us how to have the perfect marriage, how to have the perfect family. But we need to understand, believers, that those ways of viewing Jesus Christ are idolatry. We do not set the terms under which we receive Jesus Christ. It is God who, set, who sets the terms under which we are to understand and receive Him as our Lord and Savior. And under God's terms, we did not need a great patriot. We did not need somebody to lead a political party. We did not need a therapist. We, we, we did not need a get-rich-quick scheme. Instead, what we needed most was atonement. And in giving us Jesus Christ, that is what God has provided on His terms. God created us to live for His glory, to love Him, to satisfy our hearts in Him. But yet we had none of that. We have offended a just and holy God. And we are accountable to Him. And He has given us Jesus Christ to make atonement for that. To reconcile us to God. And that is what Pastor Mark is going to talk about here as he comes forward to lead the elements of communion this morning. The High Priest Campus made his prophecy. It is incumbent or expedient that one man die. He didn't really understand what he was saying. Or what he was talking about. But he should have. You see, the principal job of the high priest was the offering of the atoning sacrifice. Now, during the ordinary daily life of the temple, other priests would offer sacrifices each day. And they would offer two sacrifices specifically for atonement. They would offer a bull in the morning and a bull in the evening. And the burning sacrifice that was offered would be continually then on that altar before God. Other offerings would be placed on top of that throughout the day. Uh, Caiaphas would have had some supervisory uh, responsibilities with respect to those offerings. But his main work was done on one day of the year. It's a great job. And that was a day called the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. 
That's when Caiaphas did his thing. That's when he put on his festive garments, his ceremonial garments, and he would take them off and he would put on white linen garments and when he was finished with his work, he would put those ceremonial garments back on. This was his big day because on that day, Yom Kippur, he was offering an atoning sacrifice for the people. A good for one year. It had to be repeated year by year. And so that was his annual, annual thing. There, was, there were other things that he did. But this was the highlight of his year. And he understood that it was necessary for blood to be offered to a holy God in order for the sins of the people to be atoned for. And before he offered their sacrifice... He had to offer sacrifices for his own sin. And so the entire system, the entire sacrificial system, for that matter, was built around the idea that in order for people to have their sins removed, covered as it would, as it were, a, a sacrifice, a perfect specimen, had to be offered to God uh, for the sins of the people. The symbolism was this, sin is a capital offense. The people of Israel had sinned against God, and so they should have been destroyed. But God in his mercy had provided a means whereby they could be forgiven and enjoy the blessing of God uh, for at least another year. And that was through the offering of the blood on the Day of Atonement. Uh, the temple there in, in Jerusalem had two parts, uh, the building itself. There was the, the holy place, and it had lamps in it and a table that had fresh bread put on it every day, an altar of incense, and the priests could enter that sanctuary every day. In fact, they had to in the morning and the evening uh, to make sure the lamp was burning continually, once a day to offer incense, and uh, then they would have to come in and exchange uh, the old bread for fresh bread every day. But they could only go into the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, once a year. And the only one who could do that was the high priest Caiaphas, or whatever high priest was ruling at that particular point in time. And before he could do that, he had to fill a censer full of incense because ceremonially, it was believed that God himself dwelt within the Holy of Holies. And to enter that and see him directly would kill you if you were the priest. They actually had bells sewn onto the bottom of the priestly robes. As long as the bells were, uh, you know, making their little tinkling sound, you knew the priest was alive. I'm told that they tied a rope around the priest's ankle before he would enter that inner sanctum, lest he somehow offended God and died. They couldn't go in and get the body. They would just hear that the bells are no longer ringing and, and remove him that way if, if it came to that. I don't know that it ever did, but it was a precaution that was apparently taken. So he would reach his censer full of incense behind the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, and he would fill that room with a cloud of incense smoke. And then, after that was done, he would take a basin that had blood in it. Now, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there anymore. We don't know exactly what happened to it. it disappeared around the time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, I understand it's stored in a factory full of stuff today. After, no, that's... Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, but you, he would go and he'd sprinkle blood there where the ark should have been uh, to make atonement for the people. And the whole symbolism was this. Sin being a capital offense, somebody has to die. The sinner has to die. By rights, the entire nation should have died. But what he would do on the Day of Atonement is he would put his hands on the head of the animal that was to be sacrificed, and he would confess the sins of the people. And symbolically, the sins of the people would be transferred to the animal that was destined to die. 
And then that animal's blood would be shed. Blood was shed. Uh, the blood of the one that was guilty of the sin. Because remember, the priest would transfer the sin of the people to the head of the sacrificial animal. It would then become guilty of the people's sin. It would then die in place of the people. So this was acted out every year of Caiaphas' life. And when he became high priest, he himself acted it out. And so on the day when he said it is expedient that one man die for the people, he, he should have probably understood what he was saying. Understanding that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, what did that mean? It meant that he must fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53. He must die for the people so that the nation would not perish. And so it was at the cross. The sins of the world were placed upon our Lord Jesus Christ. When John saw him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, John the Baptist understood what he was saying. That this was the Lamb. The perfect Lamb. The only one who could possibly offer a, an atoning sacrifice for the people. And so they examined him. They found no fault in him. And he then became the Lamb of God. Carrying to the cross the sins of the people. And in the wisdom of God that included your sins. Because your sins against God are capital crimes. You deserve to die. And your only hope is that someone acceptable to God uh, can somehow come and take your place. And that day at Golgotha, one did. As Jesus made his way to Golgotha, he was carrying on his back something more heavy than the cross. I'm convinced that it was not the weight of the cross that drove him to the cobblestones there. He was a strong man, and in spite of the beating, I believe he could have made it uh, to the cross, to Calvary, uh, had he been carrying nothing other than that cross, but he was carrying something far more heavy, the sins of the world. And having become guilty before God of the sins of the world, which was the role of the sacrificial lamb, he fought his way to the top of Golgotha. He had to have some help to get the cross there. But then he allowed himself to be crucified. And he had told his disciples that God had put legions of angels at his disposal should he decide, no, I'm not going to do this. But he did not call upon the angels for deliverance. Guilty before God of your sin. He was crucified for you. He was subjected to the shame that you should have experienced. And as the blood dripped down his arms and onto the ground, it was the blood of atonement. He was doing the work of a great high priest. Doing work that was symbolized by what Caiaphas did. All of the sacrifices had been pointing ahead to this day when the ultimate sacrifice would be offered by the ultimate of high priests. And there on the cross, atoning blood was offered to God. And so, as it said in the song we sang, God could look at him and be satisfied with us. Why? How is it possible, given my sin, that God could ever be satisfied with me? 
because he was satisfied with the blood that was offered that day for my sin and your sin. And he says to sinners, uh, truly believe. Truly believe it was for you that this is what your sin deserved. That he, the Son of God, came to die for your sin. And when in repentant faith, what Fanny Crosby referred to as that soul that truly believes, in that moment of belief, we receive full pardon from our sin. Not because God just decrees that it goes away, but because the price was paid in full. Atonement has been made. And so what Caiaphas was doing year by year was finally finished. No more sacrifices needed to be offered because the ultimate sacrifice had been offered on Golgotha and that sacrifice was accepted as sufficient. Our sins have been paid for in full. So, communion then. We reflect upon the atonement. We reflect upon the sacrifice, the broken body, and you know, as the, the sacrifices were offered, they were divided and carefully arranged on the altar by the priests. And we think of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the bro bones, but there it is. This is the sinner. And here's the sinner's blood. Are you satisfied, God? And he was. And so we remember that broken body and that shed blood. The Savior who was broken, the blood he shed. And as we symbolically participate then in that sacrifice, uh, we remember and we renew ourselves in our love and devotion to him. With those thoughts, I'd like to ask the men who are going to serve communion to come forward at this time. That's God's blessing on the bread. Father, it's appropriate before a meal that we say grace, that we give thanks for what we are about to receive. And we thank you for this bread, and more importantly, for what it symbolizes. We thank you that your son, the bread of life, was broken for us as we partake of this bread. Work in our hearts through your Holy Spirit so that we would remember uh, with love that gift of love you gave us that day at Golgotha. And renew us in our devotion and in our love for our Savior, your Son Jesus. Amen.